Power supplies are messy. Even batteries that are the smoothest power available will slowly decrease in voltage over time. Switching power supplies that turn the power on and off and on and off rapidly are incredibly energy efficient and they produce a power that is about as smooth as riding down a city street on a washing machine. Generators vary based on physical factors such as the wind speed or the water speed or the temperature. And even the wall power supply has variations as the other people in the neighborhood turn things on and off and the power dips and surges and dips little bits or even large bits when a power line goes down and it has to reroute across all the other lines available. Power is messy. Integrated circuits are much more orderly creatures. They like even power, a nice steady voltage. And one of the easiest and cheapest ways to achieve this is with a linear voltage regulator, also known as a series voltage regulator. Basically, you give this regulator more voltage voltage than it needs, and it brings it down to what you actually need. For example, if you want a 5 volt supply, you might give it a 7. And that 2 volts will be wasted based on how much current you're drawing. And waste is bad, especially since it will be generated as heat, and you might need a heat sink if the difference is too great. But the benefit is it has what's called headroom. If your voltage dips for whatever reason at the source, the linear voltage regulator has plenty left over to give you what you need still. And you might even have more than one voltage source inside a device. You might have your 120 volt or 220 volt wall supply brought down with a transformer to maybe 24 volts. You might have a device that uses 12 volts to drive its fans, 5 volts to drive its USB connectors, 3.3 volts, and 1.25 volts to drive different integrated circuits with it. So you might have more than one voltage regulator within the same device. But a linear series voltage regulator is just a simple three terminal device. I've got four in this tiny little bag and they fit right in my breadboard. And of course they come in different form factors based on what you want to solder them to or whatever. But in its purest form it's just a three terminal device. I am using one of the most commonly and cheaply available ones, which doesn't mean it's lower quality. It just means it's been around for a while so it's been tweaked and honed and it does what we want, so we keep using it. The LM317L. So let's see how it's used. So here we have our three terminal device. This is the LM317L. And just to make it clear, I'll draw its wires like this. This wire is commonly called in, this one out, and this one adjust. So we'll say ADJ. Now there are two types of linear voltage regulator, series and shunt, also known as parallel. Apparently my black marker died overnight. I've had this thing less than a month. Apparently these aren't such good quality ones. So a series device will connect from the power through the device, through your load or whatever, and then they will all connect to your return, to your negative, to your ground, to your whatever you want to call it. So you can see one of the lines goes straight through, interrupted by the device. A parallel will connect this, and then you have your common negative. And you can see the difference is this is allowed to go straight through. The device is intervening, the device has an effect on it, but it's not going through the device. The device is part of the circuit modifying the live circuit rather than being an input and output. A voltage regulator is going to be a series one. The shunt is generally used more as a voltage reference, which we'll get into later. But this is the device, a series one, is the one when you have a power supply and you want to bring that power supply down to a different power supply for part of your circuit. When you want to control how much voltage is going to something. You can use either device in either situation, but this one is designed for this purpose. So first of all, you have your input. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. This could be a switching power supply, this could be your wall wart, this could be batteries, just whatever your input power is. So the circuit begins simply enough. You connect the positive voltage to the input line. Then you have a capacitor. Remember how we were talking about decoupling capacitors? This is the first decoupling capacitor. It goes down through here and to the negative. The purpose of this capacitor, and this is the larger one, this is the one that's meant to handle dropouts when there's a dip in the power, when everybody turns on their 
television at the same time. Because it just came over the radio that David Attenborough farted on live television and everybody wants to see it. So this capacitor will charge up from the power supply and sit at the input voltage. The voltage that's going in. This is your 7 volts, your 12, 24, whatever. And whenever the power supply dips, this will start supplying some power. And it doesn't really hurt to have a diode up here just to say it can't backflow. But generally your power supply is going to have its own backflow protection in it. And that diode will be dropping some of your voltage on its own, which is wasteful. So you have to consult your circuit diagram, your power supply, to see if you really need such a thing. But it certainly can't hurt. When in doubt, stick one in there. The worst you do is waste power. So this is not part of the regulator. This is just meant to keep the regulator supplied at all times. Then, the output is once again a junction, and we have another capacitor. This is the small one. This capacitor is for what's called ripple rejection. This is the main decoupling one that's meant to supply the regulator when there's a drop in the input. This one is smaller. It's meant to filter out the higher frequency ripples, the little tiny ones, the little quick ones. This should be as close to your load as possible. In fact, here's our load. And when I say as close as possible, I mean as physically close as possible, because that's going to improve the response time. Because while electric fields propagate on the order of the speed of light, nothing's instantaneous, and every little bit matters. So the IC, the integrated circuit, wants a nice smooth line. And this one makes sure the regulator always has enough power to bring it down to a nice steady flow that's not perfect, but it's there. And this one makes it more perfect. Now regulators, you always have to have more input than you're actually regulating to. If this is 5 volts, you want at least 7 volts or so. There always has to be that headroom, because if you are at 5 volts, then if it jerps down, you're going to go below 5 volts. It's not going to regulate very well. You always want to have more power than you need so that you can have a nice smooth output. So if it goes, you know, 7, 6, 7, 6, 7, 6 or whatever, this is still going to put out 5 the whole time. Because when it's outputting 7, it's wasting 2 volts per amp or whatever. When it's doing 6, it's wasting 1. So it's wasting less if the input voltage is low, but you're still getting the same output voltage. That's why you need the headroom. So this one smooths the input voltage. This one smooths the output voltage. Voltage, and this one converts between. So how do you actually work this thing? So first of all, you have a resistor right about here. And you connect from here, make another junction, over to the adjust pin. You're connecting the output to the adjustment pin. Isn't that weird, you say? This is working sort of like a voltage divider, kind of, not really, but somewhat. The point is, here is your adjusted resistor. And for now, let's just say through the internal magic of this device, because we'll go over the details of how something like this works in another video, because it's called integrated circuit for a reason. This thing inside this box is an entire circuit of stuff doing things, and we're using it in a circuit. So that's why we think of it as a box, so that we don't get all confused. This has three pins, it just does its thing. But this is always set. And according to the spec sheet for this device, this resistor should be 470 ohms. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually good to go with what the manufacturer recommends. So this one is just set, and that's a common value. You'll find that value all over the place. An easy to acquire resistor. And this one is adjusted. There's a formula too. We'll go over that in a moment. But this is your circuit. And you can even think about it not having the capacitors if you want to simplify. Without the capacitors, it works just fine. It just doesn't work as nicely. This makes it nice. Nice. And this makes it super nice. So all you really need is your regulator, a fixed resistor, and a potentiometer, a trim pot, or if you just use the formula, another resistor. Once you decide what your input and output are, you just use the formula to figure out what this resistor should be. So it's just this and two resistors, the capacitors are there to make it nice, and there you go. And we can even simplify by taking the resistors out, because we get the point. So this is just your circuit. The input goes through and out in a, in a circle like that. And then the only trickery is this adjustment pin. You connect out to adjust with a resistor, and you connect adjust to your negative with another resistor. And just for fun, the manufacturer specifies that the output voltage, what you're trying to get, should be 
from 1.25 volts minimum to 32 volts maximum. So this thing is used in all kinds of devices. It has a really wide range and high tolerance. I told you it's been refined over time. The difference between input and output, how much it's dropping, as in how much voltage is gone from the input to the output, should be a minimum of 2.5 volts and a maximum of 32 volts. So for example, if you want a 5 volt output, according to the spec sheet, you should have a minimum of 7.5 volts coming in. And again, that's the headroom. That's to make it work. If you don't have that headroom, this thing isn't regulating properly and it's going to ripple and do nasty things. As long as you have much more than you need, and I say much more, it's not horrendous, but as long as you have a chunk more than you need, this works fine. It can handle a minimum of 2.5 milliamps and a maximum of 100 milliamps. 100 milliamps is more than enough for anything we'd be doing. A tenth of an amp. So this is clearly meant for computer style circuitry, for computing, or for speakers, or something like that. It's not meant to power a motor. But you'll notice it has a minimum current. If you are not putting through 2.5 milliamps or more, which you're probably going to be, but if you don't, again, this thing won't work quite right. So it's not for super duper ultra low current specification. If you are using something that's super high, super low of any parameter, whether it be temperature, voltage, current, anything, on the extremes, there are devices made for that. All of the things I use are right smack in the middle. You know, consumer grade. The capacitors that we aren't showing right now, it recommends if you're using good quality capacitors, in this case it recommends ceramic ones, these are non-polar. The polar ones that have a positive and negative pole are electrolytic. So it recommends ceramic capacitors, so you can hook them up in any order. The one over here that it calls reducing the input ripple, the decoupling capacitor, it actually says you should use a 10 microfarad capacitor. And it says you can even add a 0.1 microfarad capacitor next to it if you really want, and that is going to improve things. So you'll filter out the big drops and then you'll filter out a little bit of input ripple, such as leftovers from a poor quality switching power supply. But again, they're not necessary, they just make it nice. The output capacitor, it recommends one microfarad. That is your, as it calls it, transient response capacitor. It's the output ripple. After the regulation, this one maintains the output voltage nicer. These maintain the input voltage nicer. And it says you can even add a capacitor on the adjustment. Because apparently what happens is if you have a ripple through the output, so you got a capacitor over here smoothing this ripple, but the ripple is going through here as well, and this trickery can actually amplify the ripple and make this perform worse. But, according to the manufacturer, that ripple is usually minimal. Kind of one of those, you'll know if you need it situations. So if you're sitting here going, do I really need that? You don't. And plus, they even said you have to put diodes and stuff on there to make sure it doesn't backflow. Overall, just don't worry about it. But, if you read the spec sheet, you can see documentation on how you can if you really want to. But basically, you just want your input and output capacitors in parallel, just stick them in there, right next to the IC, and you're good. So now that we have our diagram, what's the formula? Because we have our resistor here, but what's this resistor? So the manufacturer's formula is as follows. Voltage out equals voltage reference, hold that thought, times 1 plus R2 over R1 plus I, the current, from adjust pin times R2. So this is the voltage output. Let's say we want our 5 volts. And you'll notice the voltage input is not part of this. That's the magic of the regulator. That's the two resistors in the voltage division. Now this part the manufacturer says you can actually delete. Because the current going through the adjustment pin is usually 50 microamps or less. Which is not nothing, but in electronics, as in everything in life, it's an approximation. You just manufacture to within a tolerance. If it's more important, you have a tighter tolerance. But there's a tolerance, and if it's in that tolerance, then you say it's great. So this is going to be a very small term compared to this, so we just don't worry about it. Now, what is voltage reference? That's just a number the manufacturer gives you. For this device, the voltage reference is... 1.25 volts. That's just a constant. You just stick it in there. Now, what are R1 and R2? R1 
is the fixed resistor, the one connected between output and adjust that we had. And if we're going by the manufacturer, R1 equals 470 ohms. So once again, that's a constant. You can change it if you want, just use this formula and test, but going by the manufacturer, there you go. So we have only one unknown in this equation. That's excellent. That's even easier than a voltage divider. So let's do a tiny bit of math. So if we take this VR, that's a constant, let's divide it over. So now we have that, right? Now let's subtract this one, and then we have R1 and R2. R1 is a constant, again. So let's multiply by R1, and we're left with R2. Let's write this more nicely. R2, the resistor we want to decide what value it should be, equals R1, which for this is 470 ohms, times the voltage output, such as your five volts or whatever you want, divided by voltage reference, which is 1.25 volts for this device, minus one. And again, here's this term that we saw in the voltage divider. Your output has to be higher than the reference because otherwise you're trying to increase the voltage instead of decreasing it and you can't just do that out of thin air. So there you go. You don't even need your input voltage. All you need is this formula. You know what output you want. This is given by the manufacturer. This is given by the manufacturer. So you just get this resistor and then just go by the spec sheet where again it says the difference between input and output voltage, how much it's dropping, should be at least 2.5 volts. And your minimum output voltage should be 1.25 volts, which happens to be the voltage reference you'll notice. And that's literally it. It's a simple circuit and easy device. So let me show you one in action. So I have my input. I'm going to use, in fact, let's say nine volt input and currently set at zero amps for safety. Here is my voltage regulator, this little three pin device right there. Here is a resistor, which is reading 471 ohms. So there's my R1. And then I have my potentiometer, which is going to serve as my R2, so you can see the voltage vary. So let's quickly set up our circuit. So we'll take the power positive to a positive rail, the power negative to a negative rail, and then using the diagram provided for which pin is which, because that's gonna vary by device. This one, I can't just give you a rule. You have to look at the documentation or do some experimentation, but once you get into multi-terminal devices that are integrated circuits, experimentation is generally not the best idea. It's not just an LED you can throw around. I recommend Googling. So the positive power will connect to the input pin, which is labeled as three, which is the rightmost if you're looking at the flat. So that is here. And I'm going to ignore the capacitors because that's just for making a nice circuit. I'm just demonstrating here. So I'm going to connect the output pin, which is pin two, which is the middle one. So the output pin is going to connect to one side of this resistor. The other side is going to connect to the adjustment pin, which is pin one, which is on the left side. So the other side of the resistor, the 470 ohm one, is going to pin one right there. And then the other half of our adjustment is once again the adjustment pin. So that's pin one again. And then that is going to connect to one side of my potentiometer, variable resistor. Because a potentiometer can work as a variable resistor or a voltage divider. In this case, I'm using it as a variable resistor. So we connect the middle pin of the potentiometer to negative power. So we've got from positive power into the input of the regulator. We've got the adjustment pin connected to the output pin through the 470 ohm resistor. We've got the adjustment pin connected to power negative through the variable resistor, which would be your R2. And then finally, we're connecting the output, which again is pin two, which is the middle one, the output, to our load. So that'll be the positive end of this LED. And then, of course, the negative end of the LED to the negative power. And nothing happens because I have my thing set on zero amps. So let's go ahead and make sure this is set in the middle. And let's turn on one milliamp. You can see the voltage goes up and it stops at 2.14 volts. And if I turn it up, basically by increasing the resistor, according to our formula, by increasing R2, if you, if you go look at the math, I know you can't see it now, but go look at the math, increasing R2's value will increase the voltage output. Decreasing it will decrease the voltage output. And of course, there is a minimum amount of voltage, a forward voltage drop of the LED. It has to go over a certain value. So let's actually measure the voltage we're getting. So we'll turn that down to zero. And then I'm going to put my voltmeter set on DC. Let's set it at 20 volts. Doesn't need to be that accurate. So I'll hook the positive pin of the multimeter to the output, which is again pin two, I believe, yes. So the middle pin, and this ought to be fun. Ah, 
There we go. And then the negative of the meter, if I can find it, to the negative power. Right now, of course, it's zero. So I'm measuring the voltage of the output pin relative to zero. So let's turn it back up to one milliamp. And you can see this is outputting 1.75 volts. So that is within the spec. The minimum was 1.25 volts output. So this is fine. It's on the lower end, but it's within the specs. So we've got three here and 1.75 is being dropped. Now, this is too low because it's supposed to be this plus a minimum of 2.5 volts, but it's being current limited. That's why the voltage is lower. So let's turn the resistor up and up and up. All right, that was at maximum. So let's turn it down and you can see the output goes down to 0.3 and it's a little unstable, but the thought is there. So you can see changing the resistor changes the output voltage as well. So if I turn up my input voltage, we're getting 1.76, let's turn it up. Nothing's happening. Remember, that wasn't part of the formula. The magic of this device, and let's see if it's getting warm. Is it getting warm? Ah, it's not really getting that warm because even though it's dropping, you know, three volts down to 1.7, so there is some loss, it's only at one milliamp. So I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and change this back to R9 and let's turn up Let's actually turn down the output voltage and turn up the current limit so we can get our full voltage. So now it's putting out the full nine volts, but it's only putting 1.26 volts out. So it's dropping a whole lot at six milliamps. Now is it getting warm? Not appreciably, it's a well-made device. The higher current would do it. So let's turn up the resistor and wow, look at that immediately. Just the tiniest bit, you see, because it's running 20 milliamps through it, because I have no extra resistor. So as soon as it gets to the forward voltage drop, because right now the diode, the LED, is not allowing much current through. In fact, it's not allowing more than a trickle current through. But the moment it overcomes its forward voltage drop enough to really get going, then it goes up and starts limiting the current. But look at the voltage though, see? The voltage goes up to two. So what if I turn the current limitation up even higher? Remember it was rated for up to 100 milliamps and that's 80? This could be spectacular. Woo! That was bright. Let's give it a good whack. Bam! That is 80 milliamps. Still, 2.3 volts. Let's turn it all the way up, 2.3. If I added a resistor, it'd be different. But the point is, this is the resistor that you use to adjust. That's why it's called the adjustment pin. Let's turn this back down, very much so. Turn that back down to five for my usual. And there you go. That is a voltage regulator in action. And that's it. You pick your output voltage and you pick your R2 value using the formula, make your circuit, add some capacitors to smooth it out if desired, and you're done. You have voltage regulation. Just obey the specs so it doesn't catch fire. If you're trying to put through two amps at 150 volts, why? Then you'd best have the fire extinguisher nearby. So a long-winded explanation for something very simple, as usual, but I want you to do more than just be able to do it. You can Google how to do it. How to do it is on this box from SparkFun. The SparkFun Discrete Semiconductor Kit. No, they don't pay me. They don't even know who I am. But I got this as part of a kit because SparkFun is great for hobbyist electronics, especially getting started. You can buy these little kits. So it came with transistors and MOSFETs and diodes and regulators. And on the cover of the box, it has circuit diagrams, the formula to calculate your resistor, which end is positive, and all this other stuff. If all you want to do is make a circuit, why are you watching this video? This video is for you to understand what's going on. I'm basically learning as I go and I'm narrating that process to you. I mean, I test before I make the video, of course. Usually everything goes as my test goes. But sometimes even in the middle of a video, I discover something new. So this is very much not just a channel for you to learn. This is a channel of learning. This is a documentary almost of my process of learning electronics. And that process of learning, I'm a bus driver. I took computer programming in college. I started with a Commodore 64 as a kid and worked up through there. I'm a bus driver. I don't work in any industry other than the transit industry. I'm a pure hobbyist. I have not taken anything beyond multivariable calculus, and that was over a decade ago, so a lot of it has gone <sighs> So the idea is I'm not talking to people who are in college. I'm not talking to people who are in the industry. I mean, if you want to listen, that's great. Maybe you just like the beard. But mostly I'm talking to people like me because I have been frustrated so many times trying to learn simple things like trying to get down the chain rule for backpropagation of neural networks or trying to understand the confusion about what's called ground in the DC circuit or all these other things that I have bashed my head against the wall over because everybody else already assumes you know or 
assumes you're learning in school. This is for people who are not in school or who are in school for something else. You know, the art majors, the math majors, the, the whoever. You know, the people, the people who are going to school for architecture or management or medicine or anything that's not this. So people who don't know this, like me, can learn it. I figure showing you how I learned it and letting you skip past all the head bashing will be rather helpful. So we'll talk more another time. I think I've gabbed your ear enough today. Until then, be seeing you.